The following program is brought to you by the University of Alabama. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dave Franco. I'm Associate Provost and Dean of the Graduate School here at UA. And it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the opening plenary <coughs> session for the 2012 NOSC meeting. Before going any further on the program, the member schools of the Engagement Scholarship Consortium are listed in your program. And there are representatives of each university here today. And what I'd like to do is start out, have each of those representatives stand and so that we can recognize the fine work they do helping us organize this conference. Anyone else? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Our opening plenary is going to be presented in two segments in keeping with the conference theme, which as you know is partner, inspire, and change. First, our presidential panel will discuss unique ways that their universities are partnering with communities and how that partnership is changing the academy. And then we'll have uh, a second part of the plenary Ambassador James Joseph's inspirational keynote address. But before going any further, it's my pleasure to introduce our university's president, Dr. Guy Bailey. Thank you so much. It's great to have you here. Uh, for me, it's great to be home. I'm in my fourth week on, on the job, and, uh, this is, but this is not my first uh, sojourn in, in Tuscaloosa. I came here 44 years ago as an undergraduate, uh, left uh, 38 years ago, with, but with two degrees. I was here six years, but I like to point out to students, I got two degrees during that time, uh, <clears throat> never knowing that I would come back uh, in the role I am today. And it's really, truly an honor and a privilege to be at this university. It's also an honor and a privilege for us to host, uh, uh, to host this conference. Uh, this is the largest gathering in the world of, of uh, engaged scholarship faculty, staff, students, and community partners. That gets your whole range of constituents if you're a president. If you've got your faculty, staff, students, and your, and, and your community partners, you've got just about everybody there. I think we have 100 presenters about 500 registrants, uh, and we're particularly happy here to host this conference for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's the first time a non-land-grant institution has hosted it, and if that doesn't tell you where engaged scholarship has come, nothing will. We think about engaged scholarship uh, as, and community outreach as part of a land-grant school's mission. I was chancellor at an urban university a couple of universities ago, University of Missouri, Kansas City. We saw that as part of our mission, but for traditional universities like the University of Alabama to see it as there is, as a central part of the mission tells you uh, how far this field has come. We're also ha happy to partner with Auburn University in doing this, and most people think that uh, Alabama and Auburn don't do very much in common. It's, I have to tell you, it's not, not true. I have a daughter who has three degrees from that school, so they have a lot of my money. And, uh, <laughs> but, and they did a nice job with her, too. Uh, I could never say anything bad about them, you know, you, around your daughter and so forth. But they have been great to work with. And if you wonder about the, uh, uh, the relationship between the two institutions and the fact that friendships run deeper than, than uh, even the battles over football. If you simply remember what happened after the tornado last year, and as many of you know, Tuscaloosa was devastated by a, a tornado. In, in fact, we were very fortunate it did not hit this institution. But when the call for student participation in helping to clean up and, and rescue people came out, our students were there. Uh, Auburn students came as well. And it was very gratifying to see Auburn faculty, students, and staff, our students and staff, all working together on that. And if there were ever, if you ever want to see the concrete implementation of community engagement, that's it. That transformed anyone who wasn't committed to, to engagement and, uh, 
outreach before that incident at this university certainly is now. So uh, <clears throat> as I said, I think it's particularly appropriate for us to, uh, to host it here. And uh, I'm looking forward to the presentations, to hearing from my fellow presidents uh, as well. And I want to offer some special thanks to people who've made this conference possible. Dr. Hiram Fitzgerald from Michigan State University, president of the ESC board, uh, the entire ESC board, Dr. Fitzgerald and the board members. Would you raise your hand? Or, uh, so we, yes, thank all of you very much. At our university, Dr. Carolyn Dahl and the, the uh, uh, Con College of Continuing Studies <clears throat> and their staff for their extensive work in planning and implementation, and Dr. Samori Pruitt, uh, who works for me and uh, keeps me focused on this issue even when my mind tends to wander somewhere else. And then special thanks to all who are listed in the conference program. It's, it's a delight to have you here. I think the weather's going to clear up and you're going to enjoy beautiful October days in Alabama. Again, welcome very much. I wanted uh, President Bailey to have the first word here, so I did not tell you a little bit about his background, but I'm going to do so right now before introducing the, uh, the rest of our panelists. Because as he said, he's only been here uh, less than a month and already has made a huge mark on the campus. Uh, before coming to UA, Dr. Bailey served as president of Texas Tech University, and I know there's a lot of folks here from Texas Tech. There you go. Um, he was there from, as president from 2008 to 2012. And during that time, Texas Tech saw its enrollment grow by 14%. Its research expenditures increased by almost $90 million, or 170%. And graduation inc rates increased markedly. Tech met the state criteria for participation as a national research university fund. And Dr. Bailey and his team completed a $1 billion business plan at Texas Tech to guide the university to an AAU-like profile over the next decade that will increase the university's economic impact from an annual figure of $1.4 billion to over $3.7 billion. He also served as a chancellor of the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and provost and executive VP at the University of Texas at San Antonio and held earlier positions at other universities. Um, he brings an expertise uh, from all of those uh, institutions, as do our other presidents. And that's one of the reasons why this panel is going to be so exciting. Uh, you've already met uh, Dr. Bailey, but let me take a moment to introduce the other members of our distinguished panel of presidents. First, Dr. William V. Muse. Bill Muse served as the president or chancellor of three universities, Auburn University, the University of Akron, and East Carolina University over a period of almost 20 years. He had earlier served as the business school dean at Texas A&M, Nebraska, and Appalachian State, and as a business school professor at Georgia Tech and Ohio University. His PhD in management is from the University of Arkansas, and he's currently the president of the Kettering Foundation's National in Issues Forum Institute. And he also serves as the vice chair of the United Way Foundation of Greater Cincinnati, among many other board appointments. Next, please meet Dr. Lee T. Todd, Jr. Lee Todd is a professor of electrical engineering and the former president of the University of Kentucky, a position that he held from 2001 to 2011. He received his undergraduate degree from the University of Kentucky and his master's and PhD degrees from MIT, where he received six U.S. patents. In 1984, he left the university and began two, te and began two technology companies based on his patented research activities. One of those companies was purchased by Hughes Aircraft and another by IBM. Dr. Todd also founded the Kentucky Science and Technology Corporation, a not-for-profit organization focused on increasing university research capacity, developing science education, and encouraging an entrepreneurial economy. He's a member of the National Academies Committee on Research Universities and serves as chair of the advisory board for the National Science Foundation Directorate for Education and Human Resources Committee. And he is the past chair of the board of directors <laughs> of the APLU. And finally, Dr. David Wilson. 
who is the president of Morgan State University and has a long record of accomplishment and more than 30 years of experience in higher education. Dr. Wilson holds four academic degrees, a BS in political science, an MS in education from Tuskegee, and an EDM in educational planning and administration from Harvard University, and an EDD in administration planning and social policy also from Harvard. He came to Morgan State from the University of Wisconsin, where he was the chancellor of both the University of Wisconsin Colleges and the University of Wisconsin Extension. And before that, he held numerous other administrative posts in academe, including executive positions at Auburn and Rutgers Universities. Dr. Wilson was named one of the nation's top 100 leaders in higher education by the American Association of Higher Ed and was honored by the University of Alabama last year with an award for outstanding leadership and engaged scholarship. My pleasure to recognize and welcome this distinguished panel to the National Outreach Scholarship Conference. Thank you. Now, we anticipate a lively discussion with our presidents here, and we might begin this conversation by asking our presidents two simple questions, which are not all that simple why their respective campuses see engaged scholarship as an important part of their mission, and secondly, how their campuses have supported this approach to scholarship, and what have been the challenges that they have seen in supporting engagement scholarship in their respective campuses. Gentlemen, go ahead and whoever wants to start first. Go ahead. Well, I had the <coughs> opportunity to um, serve as president or chancellor for three universities uh, over a, a period of about 20 years. And for 15 years prior to that, uh, worked in academic administration. So my comments will be focused on really a composite of um, all of those experiences in terms of engaged scholarship. But I'd have to tell you that my philosophy about what constitutes engaged scholarship and the importance of engaged scholarship was shaped much earlier. As, as a young boy, I became captivated by the sport of baseball. And I read every book I could find about how to play the game. But I learned very quickly that in order to play the game well, I had to venture out on the field. And that is where the real learning took place over a period of practice and putting into place what I had practiced to do. And this shaped my educational philosophy. As a undergraduate and graduate student, I found that I learned as much, perhaps more, from my out of classroom experiences than I did uh, inside the classroom. So as a faculty member later, uh, my field was in business administration, I used in-class exercises like the case method and used assigned projects in order to help the students implement or learn more about what they had been taught. As a business school dean, I uh, established internship programs for the students, brought practitioners from the uh, uh, business world in to teach, and formed one of the first uh, small business development centers in the nation. As a president, I encouraged all of the academic programs uh, with admittedly mixed success, uh, but to provide opportunities for their students to apply what they had learned. I'm very proud of one of the uh, uh, examples of where an academic program really did an outstanding job of that, and that is a rural studio that was implemented by the School of Architecture at, at Auburn in the Black Belt here in Alabama. And you'll have an opportunity to visit that on Wednesday as a part of this program. Now, I came to conclude that there are three very distinct stages uh, to the learning process. And I call these my triple A's. Uh, acquisition, assessment, and application. 
our traditional focus in higher education has been on the acquisition stage where we help students acquire the knowledge that we perceive that they need to know about a particular subject through lecture, through demonstration, and through er, uh, other methods. And this is usually done by a, a specific individual professor who this uh, individual then typically is responsible for performing the second stage that of, of assessment, uh, determining to what extent the student has gained an understanding of what is perceived to be important. The third stage, that of application, uh, which is central to uh, certain disciplines like medicine, for example, but too often, in my opinion, it has been what we get to if we have time. But the world of higher education is changing very rapidly. And I believe that these changes will bring engaged scholarship, bring, bring the uh, application stage uh, to the forefront. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in our discussion. Thank you. <coughs> um. Bill, thank you uh, for uh, your remarks. Um, I, I guess I would like to come at this just a little bit uh, uh, differently. Um, I actually assumed the presidency uh, because of my career uh, in outreach scholarship and engagement. Uh, and I just want to give you some sense of how that happened, uh, and then I'll answer the question directly. Um, I had had a pretty kind of traditional tenure uh, in higher ed until I got to Rutgers Camden uh, in um, uh, roughly 1988. Uh, and when I arrived at Rutgers Camden, uh, Rutgers Camden, of course, is located in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, and it is one of the more challenged cities in the United States. Um, and as I walked that campus, uh, it was truly an enclave. And what I heard in the city of Camden was that there was this understanding amongst residents that Rutgers was in Camden, but not of Camden. And they saw this tremendous disconnect. And the provost and I had a conversation about how that institution uh, could not just be in the city of Camden, but could also be of Camden, and that could also extend its, its tentacles into that city and into South Jersey to bring about needed change. And it was at that point that I began to understand the transformation that could actually occur uh, when an institution looked beyond its boundaries and beyond itself and began to challenge the faculty and others uh, to think about their scholarship in ways that would actually bring about that transformation. And while having just the time of my life at Rutgers Camden, uh, my telephone rang, and of course, it was the gentleman to my right, Bill Muse, uh, who was the president at Auburn and who had come to Auburn with the same kind of perspective in terms of the role of an institution that I have been a part of in terms of the transformation at Rutgers Camden. And uh, Bill convinced me uh, that he was also about extending the tentacles of Auburn uh, even more across this state, particularly in the Alabama Black Belt, uh, and to uh, work with faculty to make sure that if they follow along, that their scholarship and their research would count in the tenure and promotion process. Uh, and so for a very long period of time, seven years to be exact, we worked assiduously uh, with the Faculty Senate, with uh, others uh, at the university, uh, to bring about a reform of the tenure and promotion process at Auburn to reflect the fact that if, if, if faculty uh, actually uh, engaged in this research, engaged in this scholarship and apply it, that they would actually be promoted in the tenure and promotion process. And so with that kind of backdrop, let me just say a word or two about uh, what I do now, uh, and then I'll, I'll bring this uh, to a close. Um, I'm the president of Morgan State University in Baltimore. And for those of you who don't know much about Morgan State, we are an institution of roughly 8,200 students. But we have a number of first associated with us. Uh, we are uh, the first, or I should say number one, in the United States uh, in producing African-American electrical engineers uh, we are number three in the United States in producing African-American engineers overall. Um, by the way, North Carolina A&T is number one, Georgia Tech number two, and we're number three. 
uh, we are number three in the United States in producing African American doctoral recipients. Howard University being number one, University of Michigan being number two, and we're number three. And when I came on board, um, the institution, much like Rutgers Camden, uh, found itself having paid a whole lot of attention to producing those graduates to lead uh, the nation in innovation, but had not paid a lot of attention to how the institution could transform the area where the institution is located in northeast Baltimore. And that particular area, too, is beset with a number of challenges. And so for an entire year, uh, we engaged in a strategic planning process uh, to think about how this research institution, as it continues to grow and mature, would not just do that for the sake of becoming just another research institution. How could we do it with applied scholarship and research in mind? And so uh, we have uh, introduced uh, something at Morgan that we are calling the Morgan Community Mile. In essence, we have drawn a circle around the campus that is a one mile radius. And that's gonna be our focal point for the next 10 years. And we are now conducting an extensive analysis of everything within that mile. Unemployment, the nature of small businesses, education uh, attainment, uh, we're looking at uh, the rate of innovation within the mile, crime within the mile, and basically we are then bringing those results back to our faculty and are saying to our faculty, if you join us in bringing about reform in Northeast Baltimore with Morgan as the anchor institution, when you're up for tenure and promotion, it is going to count, and you can come back at any given point in your life and look at what your work has led to in terms of the difference in the lives of the people that it has made. Uh, so I have much more to say about that, but I'll stop there. I'm eager to hear that. So uh, I'll give a bit of a personal story about why I thought engagement was important. Uh, I came out of, I've been in business for 18 years um, when I started the presidency at UK. But primarily my wife and I are native Kentuckians from rural Kentucky, started first grade together and uh, cared about the state. I made a comment when I interviewed that I don't be the president of a university, I don't be the president of this university. Part because I thought that the University of Kentucky could change Kentucky and, and it needed it. Later in my uh, year, my first year, I came up with a term called Kentucky Uglies. <coughs> it just hit me one day, I was speaking at a health conference and I looked at the statistics and I said, damn, this is ugly. And I said, if we don't face up to it, if we don't count this stuff, if we don't measure this stuff, we're never gonna solve it. We did a bus tour the next year throughout the state to talk about our research challenges. And I looked through a book the other night and there must have been 100 headlines about that trip and all of those had Kentucky Uglies in the headline. It at least drew attention to the fact that we're gonna talk about these things that have been holding us back. We're leaders in lung cancer, health, con uh, heart conditions, uh, poor oral health, and so forth. But when I took the, the job, uh, it appeared to me that the university had been acting like it was already a big research university, stiff arming the K through 12 system and not doing much, not working in the shadow of our dormitories on some of the problems that were really eating at our city with uh, the gap between the, the students that were in our population. And I made the comment that, you know, we need a higher purpose. We've been challenged by the governor to become a top 20 public research university. And we could do that. Let's just hire a bunch of scientists and engineers. Let's go after the federal grants. Let's forget about you know, arts and sciences, the arts, uh, some of these other colleges. And we can be top 20 measurably by 2020, but we'd fail the state of Kentucky. We need to change Kentucky. I'd like to see our best minds working on our toughest problems. And uh, that attitude, and I think you hear it from these two presidents, uh, it, it helps when it comes from the president's office. Uh, it, it makes a, uh, people at least listen. It's unfortunate, but it, that's the way it works. I realized that we were a land-grant university. We had an ag extension network that had done a tremendous job. I call them our trusted ambassadors. Everybody knew them. Um, they were out there, and they were doing agriculture and family nutrition very well. But I thought they were undervalued for what they could do. We had a conference of um, all the ag agents in my first year, and I asked six of our deans from business and engineering, healthcare and so forth, to speak to that group of agents about how they could use their network for research in their fields. 
After that, the six deans lined up in a table, and uh, the biggest line was behind the fine arts dean. And the rural ag agents were saying, we need arts in our communities. And I'm proud to say that we have probably the only fine arts ag agents in the country right now. I think we have four of those, and the counties pay for them. Uh, but I told the agents, you can be a conduit for us. You don't have to understand everything we do, but you have to know how to make contact between a need and your community. Once I got talking about it, several people popped up and wanted to do something. And then I figured out we ought to put this together because I can't handle it. Presidents have about that much time to spend on anything. Uh, and uh, many of you know Phil Greasley. Uh, Phil is doing well. If you know he had a health problem, but he's doing great. Just talk to him. Uh, I put him as Associate Vice President of Engagement. And we defined what we call the Commonwealth Collaboratives. And I told the faculty, send me a proposal about some problem that Kentucky has where you feel that your research can have an impact. And I'm only going to give you $10,000. It's just in-state travel and maybe part of a graduate student. Um, find something you can measure. That's my engineering business background, I guess. So we can see whether we're making progress or not. We got 41 proposals in that uh, effort. Phil oversaw those. I'll get into the assessment of all that in just a few minutes. But they took on problems like preterm births, which was 18% in my home county in Kentucky, got it down to 4%. They took on methamphetamine training for police forces. They took on tobacco-free communities to try to rid a tobacco-generating state uh, of some of the lung cancer issues that we've had. And they took on real problems. Pragmatically, there were two things that drove me. One, I thought it made sense and that people would want to do it. Two, though, we needed to be covering the state politically because all the regional universities were, were uh, vying for cash just like we were. And if we were the University of Lexington, that didn't make much sense. Even the ag, uh, the network we had was a bit discounted because, well, that's extension. It's not even really UK. It'd be here anyway. And so uh, we now have stories to tell all the politicians when we go to their local counties about things that we have done in their region using our research and using their people. Secondly, it was an effort to try to get some of the faculty who were not engaged anymore in research to be re-engaged, to take on something that they felt in their heart and, and soul that they'd like to be involved in. And that has worked to some extent as well. But uh, I just think it was the right thing to do for not only a land-grant university, but as you already heard, for any university to get out and use our knowledge to solve problems that afflict our people. You know, I'd add just one thing to that. I, I think as a, as a president, because the public is one of your constituents, uh, <clears throat> you see issues out there, you, you, you see problems, mm -hmm. and pretty soon you, you begin to realize, as all of these gentlemen have said, that you have uh, human capital resources in your university that can help deal with those. And there's been a couple of mentions of the Alabama Black Belt here. I grew up in the Alabama Black Belt. <clears throat> so I'm well aware of, of the issues there. And in coming back to the university, you, you know what the, those problems are, the issues are in your state. And you realize that you have talent. You have talented resources. Uh, you, you may not have all the money in the world, but you've got a lot of brain power there. And that you can bring to bear on problems things that, that other people can't. And th then it becomes, once you see that, it becomes your responsibility. And, uh, they're different easier to see in some places than others. When I was at Missouri, Kansas City, we straddled the line between what was the historically African American community and the, uh, uh, and the white community in Kansas City. And we, we understood that we needed good relationships with both groups. Uh, for us to be successful, uh, it was just real apparent there from our physical location, the kind of things we needed to do. We sit at the northern edge of the and northern western part of the Black Belt and Auburn, of course, at the, at the eastern part. And you understand that while the state has made uh, uh, much progress in economic and educational areas, uh, that that part of the state hasn't made the same kind of progress. And you understand that as, as a citizen of that area, you owe the area something. And, uh, uh, I, and I think all of these gentlemen will, will verify their there are faculty members that you have who are simply <coughs> waiting to be asked and, and waiting to be engaged. Uh, so uh, you, you see that as your responsibility, I think, going forward. 
Gentlemen, you touched on two really important points uh, as I was listening to what you said. First of all, universities playing a central role in the region in which they are located. It can be uh, a mile away from campus, it might be the whole state, but having a vested interest in improving things that are going on in the environs of the university. You also talked about outreach and getting involved with folks outside the university to make significant change go on. But as we know, one of the things that's really difficult in engagement scholarship is moving from the concept of outreach to engagement, where you're actually partnering with folks in the community, and they are active agents with faculty members and staff members and students to affect those changes. Do you have any tips on, on how best to accomplish that? I think some of you touched on that. And secondly, you also touched on the notion of making sure that this work counts among the faculty and students, that it counts for promotion and te tenure, that it counts in evaluations. <clears throat> Any tips on how you have done that at your respective institutions? Move to engagement and develop a, a culture of rigor. I have, I have actually uh, relied upon uh, a strategy that uh, two I developed uh, when I was at Auburn and it was a strategy when I was at Auburn where we went uh, all over the state uh, a bill and we had um, statewide conversations uh, and we invited into those conversations um, various constituents um, and basically we just asked two or three very basic questions. Um, one was, you know, what are some of the challenges that you're facing in this particular region of the state? Um, and are there programs coming from the institution that perhaps have been in place for 20, 25 years that are not working to meet those challenges? And what is it that we can take back to the institution in order to um, excite our faculty about working with you to identify the challenges that you raise? And that strategy actually um, worked very, very well for us when I was at Auburn to produce this sense of engagement, not just we are the university, but we know it all, you are the community, you know nothing, so to speak, and therefore we are coming to treat you. Uh, engagement is just the opposite. It's, uh, you have a series of challenges, uh, the community perhaps understands those challenges just as well, if not better than the university. The university has certain kind of expertise, and so how do you bring those two things together and make them work for the betterment of all? Uh, I used the same strategy when I was chancellor of the University of Wisconsin Extension and the University of Wisconsin Colleges. Uh, we went all over that state, uh, engaging all constituents in the same kind of way. And at the end of the day, I think the constituents felt that their voices were heard, uh, that whatever came uh, about as a result of that conversation in terms of a strategic plan, it was with them in mind. Uh, the faculty felt that they had a part to play in that. And, and so that worked very well there. And then uh, at uh, Morgan, um, I, I, I do something uh, a little bit different. Um, I, I actually have um, community walks. Um, uh, I uh, walk the neighborhoods uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, 6 o'clock at night. Um, I have residents actually to gather in their homes and we have coffee and tea and we talk about um, you know, what the challenges are on this block. What are the challenges within a three or four block area? And I take faculty members with me so they can hear those things directly. And when I got to uh, Morgan, the neighborhoods there didn't trust the university at all because they had seen the university actually develop and the construction projects were enormous, you know, $500 million in construction and they're seeing all these wonderful buildings go up but nothing is happening in terms of the way they're seeing the world. Uh, and so I recognize that, and so now we have uh, the great support uh, of all of those neighborhood associations, but the faculty who are part of those walks and who are part of those conversations, they understand as well you know, how to work with the communities in order to uh, promote uh, the kind of reform that I spoke about earlier. Mm -hmm. I wanna take off on one thing that President Bailey said. Uh, you, you actually, I think, have faculty out there that want to do this think about it and have contacts. And when I got in office, I said, I'm gonna let the lid off the place. I'm gonna just say, get out there and find something that you want to do in the community. 
and let's see what it looks like. And it was enough that we had to actually, actually form the vice provost office. But um, I said, if those people, after we let the lid off it, some of them don't jump, we'll have to figure out what to do with them. But uh, we had a lot of jumpers. The other piece of it was that uh, we ended up putting up a website where we could, you could go to any county in Kentucky, click on the, your county, and it would show how many engagement uh, contacts we had in that county and the telephone number for each one of those contacts. And they would either call Phil Greasley's office and get uh, somebody if they didn't know anybody or they would call the project director. Uh, we did write a lot of community proposals with uh, areas. They don't know how to submit proposals. They don't know uh, that as well, how to do all their budgets. Some of them do better than others. But we, uh, in the eight years we had this going, we put $470,000 in, 10000 a year for 47 of these collaboratives. They brought in $51 million worth of funding. We tracked it every year. So when you get to promotion and tenure, there is a real concern. When I sent the first request for proposals out, I only sent it out to tenured professors because I didn't want to capture some poor assistant professor in doing something that was really great, I thought, but the, the committee didn't think so, so they would you know, stiff arm them. So, uh, but some of the assistants got involved anyway, and they've done very well. We did put through a process of uh, uh, following the Michigan State uh, model of trying to measure engagement to make it a quantifiable plan. And I don't have the details for that one, but uh, part of that was into the map, part of that was into counting the grants and, and getting the statistics. And we have moving through the Faculty Senate a promotion and tenure policy now, but uh, I haven't tracked it in the last year. I've been, I retired a year ago, so I've been traveling. But uh, I hope it gets through. It had a lot of momentum when we left because uh, <laughs> people realize that uh, we're making some significant uh, uh, progress in there when they go back home. The last thing I would mention about getting, giving people access is that we started a network called the University of Kentucky Advocacy Network where we chose people throughout the state, uh, many of whom were not alumni of UK, but they were leaders in their community and they wanted to be attached to the university in some way. We would call that group together uh, to campus once a year, tell them what we were looking for, especially from the legislature, we would have a meeting with that group in our state capitol the, first, the day before the first legislative day and um, pump them up during the morning, have all the legislators come over, have them to invite their individual legislators to come over uh, for lunch, and we had a really good turnout. We'd always let a couple of students speak because uh, they went them over pretty quickly. But that advocacy network then heard about the types of stories that we had, and stories are powerful. When you can tell a story about somebody in the... Uh, we were on our trip and this uh, hospital director stood up and said, you know, your health care group came down and tra trained our local physicians how to deal with strokes. We had a 35-year-old young lady had a stroke last week. They treated her. She's back to work within two weeks. Uh, we wouldn't have done that. You know, it would have been late if uh, we hadn't had that training. But they come up and they stand up and tell you stories. And the advocacy network did help us a lot get the word out. But then we could point them to that map and they could go to the map and find a contact point. So that's... That's one of the ways we did it. My experience is, has been that uh, for significant engagement to take place on the part of faculty, that two conditions have to exist. The first, there has to be the opportunity for that engagement. And number two, it has to count. Uh, when, when I went to Auburn, uh, Auburn is uh, one of the land-grant universities had a well-developed uh, system through cooperative extension of connecting to local communities. But unfortunately, that uh, was limited primarily to agriculture and related disciplines. And in almost every case, there was very little student involvement in that uh, as well. I was very fortunate, as, as David indicated earlier, in attracting him to come to, to Auburn. And he was the first vice president for outreach that the university had. And he uh, worked very diligently in creating those opportunities, opportunities for disciplines throughout the university, and not just agriculture, uh, to engage uh, communities all over the, all over the state. And it was a tough battle, but we got the opportunity 
not only opportunity, but got uh, uh, engagement to count. And, and many universities, particularly those that are research oriented, left to their own uh, preferences, faculty would count research, and not only res uh, not just research, but articles that are published in referee journals. And that's the only thing that counts. We cannot afford to do that uh, as, as universities today. We couldn't afford to do it many years ago, but have done it for, for a long time. Uh, we've got to develop that constituency. And if we have the, the kind of work uh, that is done by faculty when they engage uh, communities and help them understand what they know about that uh, problem or problems that they're dealing with, and when they engage their own students in helping to solve that problem, they create tremendous support for the university uh, that is very important, particularly in terms of, of attracting state funding. And, but you have to have leadership from the top. You have to create the opportunity, and you have to make sure it counts. Mm -hmm. Just one quick thing, uh, two quick things, really. I, I want to emphasize what President Wilson said. I think the, the, the listening to uh, to, to community members, you, you can't overemphasize enough. They have insights that you can't get any other way. And, uh, you know, it's our, especially as presidents, it's our, uh, our inclination to talk. And, uh, but the truth is that's, that's a situation where we need to be listeners uh, a lot more than, than talkers. And I think the strategies he mentioned there are really, really right on the money. Uh, and again, the same thing is true with the tenure promotion guidelines. My previous university, Texas Tech, just revised those, and uh, Valerie Payton can tell you in great detail about uh, about the struggles and the successes of doing that. I think you, you do have a constituency among your faculty who are committed to this and uh, being able to empower that constituency. And uh, by the way, you also have a significant number of your students who, who want to be engaged as well. And I think empowering them is, is really a key thing, but at some other point, Valerie can give you the, all of the details of that uh, recent revision of the tenure promotion guidelines. Thank you, thank you, gentlemen. We've got about 10 more minutes yet, so I want to give us time to focus on maybe one of the key questions that all of us are interested in what do you see as the future of engaged scholarship, both within the United States, but also internationally, where many of our projects are moving to both a local area and to an international context? What do you see as some of the future benefits, challenges, whatever, in the last 10 minutes? Well, I think there are two major uh, changes that are occurring in our society that are going to bring engaged scholarship to a more central position. Uh, and the, the first is that of technological changes, and the second are economic pressures. Uh, the ability today to um, present information online uh, in a interest engaging way uh, is going to move us very rapidly to the first stage of education that of uh, the acquisition of knowledge to the online or to the uh, a video disc uh, stage. So that uh, I, I fully believe that at, at some stage, a major part of that acquisition stage in higher education is going to take place in that, in that manner. The, that then pushes the university into a counseling and assessment center uh, mode uh, a, a different role for the faculty in, in assessing whether students have met certain uh, objectives or standards as to what they know. Uh, but the, the stage that comes to the forefront very quickly is that of the application stage. Okay, now you, you, you have mastered this body of knowledge that we say is important. We've made an assessment. We, we are convinced you, you know that. Now how can you apply it? Can you apply it in the laboratory? Can you apply it in the field? Uh, and I, I see emerging in 
and almost for every discipline, the idea of, of, of the least comparable to a teaching hospital for the medical school, uh, a lab school for education. Everyone has got to have that constituency where they are, are, are much engaged in, in helping students understand the, uh, the, the discipline that they, they've taught them. And a major part of that is not just uh, information that relates to employment or job, but in preparing students to be good, good citizens. And that's a, a major role for colleges of liberal arts uh, uh, to engage in. Mm -hmm. I'm going to touch on an area that some don't think is engagement in, in some circles, but it's economic development in jobs. Um, when I interviewed for this job, one faculty member said I scared her to death because I talked about entrepreneurship and economic development. and said, I'm in the philosophy department. You're going to run these kids' minds. And so, well, we need to have a philosophical conversation about the future of our state. If we don't change the economy around here, coal, tobacco, whiskey, and horses aren't going to be our saviors. So we, uh, we track economic development, and it is a form of engagement. You have to inform potential investors who are out there that will put money up to start companies to, to um, hire your graduates. You have to involve the lawyers, CPAs, the professional community that will help those people found their companies. But you also got to let the lid off of your faculty, let them know it's okay to be involved. First year I was a, uh, we got a first year dean when I was teaching at UK and I'd started a company with these patents I had and he called me to the office and said, how can you be a professor and have a company? And I said, well, if I was still at MIT and I didn't have a company, I'd be called to the office and say, why don't you have a company? So <coughs> I'll leave if I have to and I did the next year. But um, <laughs> we track, um, but I let the lid off when I got back. <laughs> so we track startup companies at uh, UK now and we have 80 in the Lexington area that brought in $67 million worth of outside venture capital last year. You know, that's a, an indication that they've got something that people will, will invest in because there's not a lot of venture capital in Kentucky. But I really think that with the, and you talk about international, we're going to have to turn these kids to realize they're going to be working internationally. They're going to take more foreign language. They're going to have to learn more about other cultures than what we have in the past. But they're going to have to have a skill of innovation if this country is going to be competitive. And I just think higher education is the solution to that. And, and we have to work with the industries that are out there. And, and that's a form of engagement that I think is going to become more and more important. I'll just piggyback on that. Uh, you know, I, I happen to think that we've come a long way in uh, 25 years in terms of outreach engagement. Um, I, I like to think that maybe around 1995, 1997, uh, we were at a point where um, we had the support of our respective presidents in driving reform on our campuses. But uh, I think we were uh, trying to convince uh, faculty, uh, particularly the faculty in the discovery camp, uh, that we were not dumbing down the university as we promoted the scholarship of application. I think that's where we were 1995, 1997. Uh, I think we've come a long way in 25 years, uh, so much so that for me personally, it's very hard for me to take seriously a major research university today that does not have outreach and engagement at the forefront of its agenda. I think that, dis that's the, that discussion, um, and, and I realize that I might very well not be speaking for the entire chancelloral or presidential group in this, um, uh, in, in, in this commentary, but it just seems to me that we've come so far in two and a half decades that we're not having the same conversation today. And uh, to piggyback on what my two colleagues here said, I, I, I think that um, uh, the future of outreach engagement uh, is pretty much centered in perhaps two camps. And one camp may be somewhat of an unlikely camp. And this is the way I would characterize it. Um, what we are seeing in this country right now is a uh, shifting of the population. We are seeing a huge demographic shift in the country. And we are seeing the largest growth in the population occurring uh, in the minority sector. Uh, the Latino population, um, uh, African American population, multiracial population, but particularly uh, the African American and Latino population. And those populations are the least well represented populations in college degree attainment. And so, um, 
outreach and engagement, it seems to me, is going to be absolutely critical to ensure that those pockets of the population that are the fastest growing pockets that are not well prepared are as well prepared to enter colleges and universities are prepared to do so. Else, as um, Lee and, and Bill uh, and uh, President Bailey have indicated, I don't think the country is going to be competitive long term. And so therefore, our major research universities have to make a different kind of argument about outreach and engagement, that we really do need to get out there and connect with these communities and connect with those populations. Because if we don't, then who really is going to be on our campuses uh, in 15 to 20 years? Uh, so it's almost self-serving on the one hand, but it's also about national competitiveness on the other. Uh, the second camp is, I think, that of uh, what I see as a dwindling of state support for the public universities. And I know uh, increasingly as I go to Annapolis to argue for support for my institution uh, and others, uh, we increasingly hear, well, so what are you doing for the state of Maryland? Uh, what are you doing for the state of Baltimore? What are you doing for my district? And it has to go beyond simply enrolling students from that area. They're looking for real concrete things that you are doing to tackle some of these intractable problems in the state, in the district, in the city. Uh, and if you cannot make a convincing case of that, that money is going to go to transportation, it's going to go to corrections, it's going to go to those other areas that are at the table making a more convincing argument. So I think in light of, um, uh, for public universities, in light of the dwindling state support, it is also uh, in our best interest to sharpen that argument and make sure that we can say that our universities are indeed anchor institutions in our state, uh, in our cities, or in our regions. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think that point is really well taken. Increasingly, our states expect us uh, to be anchors of economic development and solvers of, of community problems, and those two things aren't unrelated. Uh, if you think about much economic development requires a highly educated workforce, it requires uh, areas with health care, it requires a lot of the things that we as institutions can either deliver or spur. Uh, when I was in Kansas City s several years ago uh, as, as Chancellor of Missouri, Kansas City, one of the interesting things I found was that the Kaufman Foundation, a large local foundation, supported two broad initiatives. One was entrepreneurship, and there was a real focus there on developing new companies, developing startups, and, and, and teaching entrepreneurship as part of a, of a college of business. It also supported K-12 education in STEM disciplines, especially in districts with large numbers of underrepresented kids. Uh, now, when you saw those at first, you might think they're unrelated, but they're really not. You, you're, you're not going to get much of the first without the second. And the Kaufman Foundation understood that these two things go hand in hand. So uh, <clears throat> one of the most important things we will do in uh, becoming anchors for economic development is, uh, is help with the education of, of our workforce and, uh, and outreach in, in that way. Uh, and increasingly, as, as President Wilson said, it's, it's not just our obligation is what's expected of us. It's not what we, just what we expect of ourselves or what we want to do, but what the states expect for us. And so to be successful, I think we have to develop good strategies for meeting those expectations. Thank you. Well, I don't know about anybody else, but I'd like to keep talking. But unfortunately, <laughs> we've about run out of time for this part of the plenary. So could we give our panelists a round of applause? Thank you, thank you very much. And now at this time, I'd like to welcome to the podium Ms. Felicia Jones, Executive Director of the Black Belt uh, Community Foundation, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you so much.
Good afternoon. Martin Luther King Jr. once said that not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. So I'd like to just take a moment, and if you would, journey with me through the life of Ambassador James A. Joseph. The ambassador is Emeritus Professor of the Practice of Public Policy and Leader in Residence for the Heart Leadership Program at the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke University. He is also founder of the United States Southern Africa Center for Leadership and Public Values at Duke and the University of Cape Town. He joined the Duke faculty in 2000 after a distinguished career in government, business, education, and organized philanthropy. He was appointed to senior executive or advisory positions by four U.S. presidents, including Under Secretary of the Interior by President Jimmy Carter and U.S. Ambassador to South Africa by President William Clinton. In 1999, the Republic of South Africa awarded Ambassador Joseph the Order of Good Hope, the highest honor bestowed on a citizen of another country. And in 2008, he was honored as a Louisiana legend and inducted into the Louisiana Political Hall of Fame. The founding chair of the Commission on National and Community Service that established AmeriCorps, he was honored by the United States Peace Corps in 2010 for his lifelong contributions to volunteerism and civil society. From 1982 to 1995, Joseph was president and chief executive officer of the Council on Foundations, which is an international organization of almost 2,000 foundations and corporate giving programs. After graduating from Yale Divinity School in 1963, Ambassador Joseph began his career at Stillman College in Tuscaloosa, where he was founding co-chair of the local civil rights movement. A frequent speaker to academic, civic, and religious audiences, he is the author of three books. He is a recipient of 19 honorary degrees and his undergraduate alma mater, Southern University, has named an endowed chair in his honor. He has also served as the chair of the Children's Defense Fund and as a member of the board of directors of the Brookings Institution, the National Endowment for Democracy, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, and City Year South Africa. One thing that was not included in what he sent me and he shared with me during our time together, which I've been most fortunate um, to have with him, is that he also chaired, he was chair of the faculty board for the Duke University Civ Center for Civic Engagement. So I hope that after having heard this, wait, I can't leave out the fact that Ambassador Joseph is married to the former Mayor Braxton, and who is an Emmy Award winning television journalist, and he has two children and two grandchildren. I hope that after having heard him speak today, you will agree with me that he's great because he has definitely served. Join me in welcome Ambassador James Joseph. Thank you very much. I spent a lot of time talking to a lot of audiences in different parts of the world. So one of my favorite pastimes is listening to introductions. <laughs> they tell you something about the expectations of the host and also provide information that helps shape your message. When I was in the Carter administration, I was in the South Pacific to swear in the newly elected governor of one of the American territories. When I was invited to address a joint session of the legislature, just before I was scheduled to speak, I leaned over to the Speaker of the Assembly and said, Mr. Speaker, how long do I have to speak? And he said, to Mr. Undersecretary, you are our guest. You may speak as long as you wish. But I must caution you that in about 25 minutes, the lights are scheduled to go off across the island. <laughs> that seems to be good caution when people have been sitting for a while. Uh, but first, let me say what a, a delight it is to return to Tuscaloosa. I have not been back since 
1964, a year after three local ministers and I launched the Tuscaloosa Citizens Action Committee. Those were difficult and those were dangerous times. But the movement we organized not only desegregated this community, but opened the door for the many advances that followed. And I say that because we could not have done it without the students as Stillman. So when I think about civic engagement, higher education, and the public good almost 50 years later, I think of those students. And when I think of those times and today's theme, I'm reminded of the ancient historian Tacitus, who defined patriotism as praiseworthy competition with one's ancestors. Now, I recall that definition of civic virtue today because it reminds us that each generation has an opportunity indeed an obligation to contribute something as significant and even as extraordinary as the generations that preceded them. And so the questions I'd like to examine today are these. One, what role should higher educational institutions play in developing, nurturing, and sustaining the civic values that lead to civic engagement. Secondly, what do these institutions need to know and teach about the modern idea of civil society, especially the civic habits and traditions of the many population groups who are changing our civic culture? And three, what can these institutions do to help define and develop civic engagement as a strategic form of social change rather than simply a form of charitable relief? What I'm suggesting is that there should be three components to what we teach, what we research, and how we promote or facilitate civic engagement. The first has to do with civic values. The second has to do with civic knowledge. And the third has to do with civic habits. This encapsulates civic engagement into three powerful metaphors, being, knowing, and doing. Let me begin with the being or values component and offer the observation that an institution is what it rewards. I've been in business, I've been in government, I've run a lot of organizations, and one of the things I learned is that an institution is not so much what it says in its value statement, what it says in its press releases, it is what it rewards its people for being. If civic engagement is an important university priority, there needs to be both guidelines and incentives that reflect what the university considers to be its values, what it claims as its values. It is not enough to simply provide incentives for students through service learning. There must be incentives to unleash the research capacity of the university as well. I was here and I heard what the president's panel said, and I'm so pleased that they represent institutions that get it. But as I travel around the country, I find an institutional culture that seems to regard practical investigation in the practical community needs, as Dr. Wilson said, as the dumbing down of research. Too many of our faculty colleagues tend to regard those who teach about civil society 
and those who call for civic engagement in Robert Louis Stevenson's phrase as practitioners of an obscure art. I'm pleased, as I said, that there are universities that get it. They are the ones who understand that one of the missions of a university is to put knowledge at the service of society. But one of the things I've learned over the years, that the best universities are those who also put the, university, the community at the service of knowledge. The second point I want to make about civic values is that we need to be very clear about what values we need to cultivate. I taught ethics at a number of universities. And for too long, those who teach ethics have focused on the private virtues that build character to the exclusion of the public values that build community. It may be that what we need most at this unique and almost apocalyptic global moment is to help both our students and our society understand how best to think about and how best to apply values to public life without getting caught up in the politics of virtue or the parochialism of dogma. I've been living in South Africa full or part-time for the last 16 years. And there's much that we can learn from a concept of community the South Africans call Ubuntu. It is best expressed by the Kosa proverb, people or people through other people. It is this powerful sense of the shared interdependence of people that lies behind the spirit of forgiveness and reconciliation reflected in the work of Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu. It is the ability to say that your pain is my pain that has allowed them to say that if your humanity is assaulted, my humanity is assaulted. If your dignity is denied, my dignity is denied. It is not, I think, therefore I am. It is, I am human because I belong. I participate. I share because I am made for community. At the heart of this spirit of Ubuntu is the willingness to take risk and to act justly and with compassion to one another. So what does it mean to speak of values that build community in a world that is integrating and fragmenting at the very same time? The more interdependent we become, the more people are turning inward to smaller communities of meaning and memory. While some find reasons for despair, it may be that remembering and regrouping are part of the first stage of the search for common ground. As I travel around the world, I hear more and more people saying that until there is respect for their primary community of identity, they will find it difficult to embrace the larger community in which they function. We will thus find it difficult to form a more perfect union in the United States as long as we emphasize the myth of individualism that leads to greed, to the exclusion of the tradition of community that saw people come together to build each other's bonds and to ensure that there was a public safety net for those in some way disadvantaged. The principle the second principle in which our idea of community needs to be grounded is one I often quote from the African-American mystic, poet, and theologian Howard Thurman, who was a mentor to Martin Luther King at Boston University. Dr. Thurman was fond of saying, I want to be me without making it difficult for you to be you. 
Can you imagine how different our world would be if more Americans were able to say, I want to be an American without making it difficult for Arabs to be Arabs, Asians to be Asians, and Africans to be Africans? Can you imagine how different our communities would be if more Christians were able to say, I want to be a Christian without making it difficult for a Jew to be a Jew, a Muslim to be a Muslim, or a Buddhist to be a Buddhist. So how do we build community? It has been my experience that when neighbors help neighbors, and even when strangers help strangers, both those who help and those who are helped are transformed they experience a new sense of connectedness. Getting involved in the needs of the neighbor provides a new perspective, a new way of seeing ourselves, a new understanding of the purpose of the human journey. When that which was their problem becomes our problem, the transaction transforms a mere association into a relationship that has the potential for new communities of meaning and belonging. In other words, getting people to do something for someone else, what John Winthrop called making the condition of others our own, is the most powerful force I know in building community. When you experience the problems of the poor or troubled, when you help someone to find meaning in a museum or creative expression in a painting, when you help to dispel prejudice or fight bigotry directed at a neighbor, you are far more likely to find common ground. And you are far more likely to find that in serving others, you discover the genesis of community. So the moral imperative of civic engagement is to help transform the lazy fair notion of live and let live into the principle of live and help live. This brings us then to the second question we need to ask. It is about civic knowledge. What should we know and what should we teach about the modern idea of civil society? Resurrected in the 1970s by the Polish workers' movement and late in debates about perestroika in the former Soviet Union, the idea of civil society is rooted in three very different visions of public life. The first was the idea of civil society as government. Civility for Aristotle described the requirements of citizenship rather than private sensibilities or good manners. It was organized around the face-to-face -face relationships of friends whose leisurely aristotic, aristocratic benevolence enabled them to discover, articulate, and promote the public good. The second is the idea of civil society transforming government, often in opposition to government. I was standing on the edge of a crowd in a former Soviet Union when an upstart named Boris Yeltsin made his first speech calling for major social reform. I was standing in a crowd outside of Parliament in Cape Town when Prime Minister de Klerk pronounced that Nelson Mandela would be released from prison and the ANC on band. On each occasion, People spoke of the rebellion of civil society against the state. They did not so much want to replace the state as they wanted to transform it. The third idea of civil society has been the notion of civil society transcending government. Unlike the private sector driven by the market and the public sector driven by the ballot, the so-called third sector is driven by something deeper and more noble, a spirit of compassion and commitment to the common good. 
It is in many ways the conscience of the other two sectors. It is even possible to argue that since civil society preceded government, it may be more appropriate to think of it as the first rather than the third sector. The attractiveness of this concept of civil society lies in its conjoining of private and public good. But in what should be its finest hour, the idea of civil society is in danger of being distorted and hijacked by those who emphasize its potential in order to bolster arguments for a more limited so social role by government. Some of the strongest advocates of civic engagement are people with an own civil state of mind. While it was clear that it was people power that led to the collapse of communism, the dismantling of apartheid, and even the fall of the Berlin Wall, there are now those who exaggerate the potential of civil society in order to bolster their claims about the role of government. Those of us, and I spent 14 years as a spokesperson for benevolent wealth, those of us who understandably and necessarily emphasize the potential of civil society have a responsibility to also point to its limits. Another of my concerns about civic knowledge, what we know and what we teach and what we research about civil society and civic values, has to do with the many ways in which the American civic culture is changing. Alexis de Tocqueville, Robert Bella, and many others have painted wonderful pictures of what they described as the habits of the heart of American people. Unfortunately, neither de Tocqueville nor Bella included in their reporting and analysis the extent to which voluntary activity and civil society in racial minority communities served as a vehicle for self-help, social cohesion, and positive group identity. As president of the Council on Foundations, 2,000 foundations from around the world, I cringed every time I heard some new guru on civil society speak of American voluntarism or American generosity if it was somehow unique to those citizens who traced their ancestry to Europe. Very disappointed in what I kept hearing, I began the research for the book I published in 1995 on the civic traditions of America's racial minorities. What I found were remarkable manifestations of civic feeling that in many instances predated but was consistent with the civic habits practice and the civic values affirmed by the larger society. As early as 1598, and long before Cesar Chavez started organizing farm workers, Latinas in the Southwest formed lay brotherhoods to assist members with their basic needs. Long before the Tocqueville, Benjamin Franklin became so enamored of the political and civic culture of the Native Americans he met in Pennsylvania that he advised delegates to the Albany Congress in 1754 to emulate the civic habits of the Iroquois. Long before Martin Luther King wrote his letter from a Birmingham jail or gave his I Have a Dream speech, African Americans in the 19th century formed so many voluntary groups and mutual aid societies that some southern states enacted laws banning black voluntary or charitable activity. Long before Robert Putnam published his first article on social capital, neo-Confucians in the Chinese community 
We're teaching their children that a community without benevolence invites its own destruction. The point I'm making it is that it is no longer possible to speak of American civic culture without reference to and respect for the very traditions that are now shaping our civic life. People around the world are coming to realize that a good society depends as much on the goodness of individuals as it does on the soundness of government and the fairness of laws. The events of the last uh, several decades have caused us to think often and deeply about whether transnational community is really possible. I am convinced that it is, but it will require us to think and to act differently. Our students who are engaged in community outreach locally and those who work abroad must be taught to respect local traditions, local cultures, and even local concepts of community. We come now to my final concern, what I have called civic habits. The idea that we tend to promote a rather limited approach to civic engagement. We are told with frequency that the world would be better off if more of us worked in soup kitchens, delivered meals to the elderly poor, or tutored kids who are at risk. Those are very important contributions. But they are ameliorating consequences when the university could help eliminate causes. The most often cited example of charitable relief is the story of the Good Samaritan. We are told that a traveler finds someone badly beaten along the side of the road and stops to help. Suppose that same man traveled the same road every day for a week, and each day he found someone badly beaten at the same spot on the road. Compassion requires that he gives get aid, but eventually compassion requires that he ask, who has responsibility for police in this road? What started out as an individual act of charitable aid leads to a concern with public policy. The first response was to ameliorate consequences, but the second response must necessarily be aimed at eliminating causes. My second point about civic habits is that the university can help to inform and enrich the public policy process. I know that many of your institutions are advised by its donors and legal counsel that it is unwise, illegal, or too risky to get involved in public policy. I've served over the years on the boards of many universities, so I know from which I speak. But I also served on the U.S. Treasury Department's task force that struggled with how to distinguish between permissible advocacy and impermissible lobbying. And I can tell you that there is much that can be done by a university to objectively inform and objectively influence policy. And finally, a third point about civic habits is that civic engagement should mean investing in the empowerment of those who are economically and socially marginalized. The university can help educate its publics, both locally and nationally, on the policies and practices needed to make our society work for all of its citizens. But it is not enough to be simply advocates who speak in behalf of the marginalized in our communities. We must help empower them to speak for themselves. If racism was the original American sin, 
the persistence of paternalism is its most enduring counterpart. We have all too often asked the wrong question in dealing with those in our communities whom we seek to help. We have been asking, what can we do about their predicament? Or what can we do for them when we should be asking, what can we do together? I like the concept of assisted self-reliance or participatory empowerment, where the affected groups provide leadership, but they are supported by outside resources. Let me thus conclude by making the point that if you are to involve your students and your faculty meaningfully in your communities, they must understand that how they are engaged is as important as in what they are engaged. There's a story told about the exit of the British from one of its former colonies. On the day in which colonial officials were preparing to depart, the governor general was overheard to say, when we came here, these people had few roads, few hospitals, and few schools. We built new roads, we built new hospitals, and we built new schools. But now they ask us to go. Why? A peasant on overhearing the conversation and interrupted to say, it is easy to understand, Your Honor. Every time you look at us, you have the wrong look in your eyes. Civic engagement aimed at eliminating poverty or advancing equity must begin first with a look at the policies and practices of our own institutions. Unless they have the right look in their eyes, your efforts will not only be in vain, but if left unattended, could damage your image, diminish your influence, and defer the dreams of those who give birth to the vision you seek to advance. And so we need to step back and ask, what assumptions, what social analysis lies behind civic engagement? What theory of change informs our practices and priorities? How often is the promotion of equity a consideration in what we conclude as successful? And finally, do we have an organized and disciplined way of learning what truly works in closing social gaps? When we provide answers to those questions, we may find that civic engagement itself may need to change. We cannot allow ourselves to become advocates of an obscure art, preoccupied with the potential of civil society and not its limits. Someone has to ask the difficult questions that too easily go unasked, and if asked, don't answer. I hope that you will be the one to return to your institutions and ask those difficult questions. Someone has to probe beyond the conventional wisdom that avoids controversy by closing rather than opening minds. You are a part of a great moment in history. I hope, therefore, that you will be able to elevate the idea of civic engagement to that of both a craft and a calling, both a discipline of study and a field of practice. Archimedes is reported to have said, give me a lever long enough and I can move the world. Those of you in this room have been given the lever. I hope you will use it to not only move your institutions and your communities, but to move the world. You are engaged in a very noble enterprise, for when you provide help, you also provide hope, and the gift of hope is as big a gift as the gift of life itself. Thank you very much.